We are in a time right now that is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's baffling to me. The research and the things that we do to see what's going on behind the closed doors. The fight. And one of the things the enemy always likes to do is to distract us so we miss the fight. There is a dimensional battles that is going on right now. There are dimensional battles. Jesus expressed the major, all of it, right? When he was battling in the garden. Go to Matthew 26. Everyone say dimensional battles. In Matthew 26 and 36. It says that Jesus came with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. That was important, watch with me. In other words, see what I see. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That is something that you and I fight to do every day. We are fighting to do the will of God and not our own. It is a continuous battle. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. This is when Jesus began to sweat blood. He was burning through. He was praying through. Blood was shed in the garden before it was on the cross. He was whipped and abused. That blood was shed for our healings. But there was a blood that was shed before anything occurred. And it was right in the garden. And again, he came and he found them asleep for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? And I want you to understand this is where many people have fallen. They're sleeping and resting. They're not alert. They're not awake. They're not praying. They're not seeing. They're not hearing. And they wonder why the enemy takes advantage of them. And they wonder why people are losing dimensional battles. Jesus was expressing three times, three dimensions that you and I had to battle through. This was his example. He said, behold, the hour is at hand. And the son of man must be, is being betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise and let us go, be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Again, these were three dimensional battles Jesus was expressing. You and I live in an arena where there's not only two realms, the seen and unseen, but there's three dimensions. Those are three time frames. You and I have a past, which is the dimension. We have a present, which is the dimension. And we also have a future. Those are three dimensions that Jesus was battling for because he had to fulfill it and win every dimensional battle so that you, can, I, you and I can continue to carry on that victory in every dimension. Does everybody understand? It was only there that he made it through all the abusiveness, the beatings, the whippings, and then the cross. See, you cannot be victorious until you start winning these battles. 
And you cannot be victorious in the battles until you fulfill the perfect law of the spirit of life, which is deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow. Again, everything revolves around those three. Even those three are associated with three dimensions. Does everybody get it? In Romans chapter 8, Oh, hallelujah. In verse 18. Romans 8, 18. In these three arenas, there are individuals who can battle in one dimension but run from the others. And you don't want to do that. You've got to battle through every one. Verse 18, read it with me. For I consider that the suffering of what? This present time, this dimension, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us where? In the future. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's who? Us. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, Eagerly waiting for the ado uh, uh, adoption, the redemption of our body. In other words, this is future event. For we who were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Why well, he's talking about two realms, isn't he? For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we, we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with what? Perseverance. Perseverance, endurance, means you got a battle. The sufferings that you and I are experiencing right now are called battles. The present time, so he's talking about what? There's a present, there's a past, and there's a future. As sons and daughters of God Almighty, in other words, we are eternal beings. Amen? Amen. We are eternal beings already. We maintain that eternal status by battling through constantly. In other words, God is waiting for all of us to continue to become unified in the spirit as we continue to battle these things. Why? Because in the transition, I want you to know that we are in a transition, but there's going to be a transformation that's future. It's coming. Then all corruption will be released. The earth will be released. Creation will be released. This is going to happen in the future. This corruption will happen, and this release of corruption will be in the future. In the future, we will have a new body. Amen? So we must wait. We must battle. That's that perseverance to stay in position. One of the things that happens is we want to stay in position in the present to access the future, but we must continue to cut loose of our past. These are the three-dimensional battles that we're constantly. How many of y'all remember when the enemy always reminds you what you did? That's where we talk about emotional attachments and soul ties and things from the past. Because the enemy can only attack you from the past. If you begin to cut yourself loose from the past, because he can't attack you from the future. This is where people lose their identity because they're always being reminded of their past. When you are always holding on to your past, you be, maintain the identity of your past. That's why the Lord wants us to live from the present to the future and from the future to the present. These are battles that you and I must battle through. That's why he tells us to loose ourselves from individuals, loose ourselves from people, places, and things from the past. Listen, the enemy can only attack you from what you've done. But God doesn't look at it. Does everybody get it? When you repented of something, that's why repentance is so important, the Lord doesn't see it anymore. But the enemy does, and he wants to remind you of it. 
But if you're really focusing on your future and who you are in Christ, those things will not affect you. Only when you are lacking your future of who you are and decreeing your future because you must decree it in. That's when you begin to lose your identity. See, if you can really see what God sees you at, we would be changed. God doesn't look at you the way you look at you. He sees you and I already in the gold-filled armor as warriors. That's how he looks at me and you. Years ago, I had a vision one day, and I've shared this before. I found myself sitting in the garden as a little boy, and I was on like a bench, like a park bench. And I had shorts on, and the Lord come walking in the garden, and he sat next to me. And he began to tell me all kinds of things. And we began to fellowship. And all of a sudden, this powerful, muscular horse comes in. And he says, it's time for you to go now. And I saw this glittering gold, and I didn't realize what it was. It was like on a coat hanger. You know, like a wooden post with a coat hanger in the corner. And when he shared with me, it was time to go. And I said, I didn't want to go. And the next thing I know, that gold armor was no longer on that uh, clothing hanger or the uh, coat hanger. It was on me. And I was on that horse as an adult. But while, when I was with him in the garden... I was a child on the bench. And as I began to leave the garden, I was dressed as a warrior on this horse. And that's how God sees us. And that's how we need to begin to see ourselves, is what God sees us as, warriors. Why? Because this dimensional battle is for a future event. We've got to constantly cut ourselves loose from all of these things and all of these labels and all the things that hinder us. That's why the word tells us as soldiers, do not entangle yourselves in the affairs of this life. Amen? Amen. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 7. Would you read it with me? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be what? Manifested in our mortal body, in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, and therefore I what? Speak. So in other words, if you believe, in other words, by believing, you're accepting what God says. I'm accepting it. So when you accept what God says, you decree it. Why? Because you must confess it. You must bring it into this realm. So all the things that God has spoken is from his dimension. Where he's at, he's brought it into this dimension so that you and I can speak it to break through all dimensions that try to hinder us so that you and I can have victory in every battle. But if you don't speak it, you don't sing it, you don't beat it. It beats you. We also... Believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For these things, for all these things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not what? We don't what? Listen, you won't lose heart if you continue to decree. 
Because what you speak is what you eat, and what you eat is what you come. People lose heart when they stop decreeing. God gave us a phenomenal gift. It's called tongues. That is a tremendous asset tool to a believer. It says, verse 17, for our what? Uh, our, yeah. Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things that are what? Not seen. So if you're always looking at the things that are seen, you'll never advance. You just can't advance. Because you're too distracted by the things seen. You can't bust through. You're always relying on what you see. Does everybody get it? See, what we see should be fruits to determine what is the unseen influence. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we see that there's two realms and three dimensions that we're talking about. Treasures of Christ. That means that you and I, the anointing, the anointing one, Christ in us, and his anointing. What? Again, to deny ourselves for the life of Christ, to manifest in his divine nature in us, his character, his integrity in our mortal bodies. Listen, by the process of sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping is such, it's, a, it's one of the laws of God that can advance each and every believer. Because whatever you sow, you reap. Amen? No matter what. Even those that are not believers always reap what they sow. In fact, everyone will wake up one day and get before God. The problem is, is people are waiting to die to get before God, but those who are believers are before God every single day. The Lord should always be before you. Amen? But in this process of sowing and reaping, we are speaking and singing out of the heart and out of the mouth. then we won't, you know, then we won't lose. We won't lose. Our hearts won't get distracted as long as we're constantly sowing because that is the process of, of battling and victory in everything that we do. Hallelujah. So we don't lose heart in this process of sowing. And, and what we're going to do is this is going to assist us in battles. We're going to maintain our eyes to see and our ears to hear through these two realms, the unseen to the, from the seen to the unseen, and battle these dimensional battles. Look at, there's a, a dimensional war going on. Does everybody agree with that? Well, the, where there's dimensional war going on, there's dimensional battles. Amen? These dimensional battles are caused by demonic influence to tempt man to sin. They are to tempt man to sin and to rebel against God. Against his will. Why? Because then it brings judgment to man in the temporary realm. And it'll also bring judgment in the eternal realm. One of the things that is needed, we need to maintain revelation of the spiritual war that is in existence. We need to encourage one another in that arena of the spiritual war that is in existence. Listen, things are getting ready to happen tremendously. Prophetically, according to the word of God, things are getting ready to happen. We are watching the very possibility very soon of a peace treaty in the Middle East. When that peace treaty is signed, that means you and I have about three and a half years left. That peace treaty can be signed any day, any moment. They are negotiating it. And people cannot be distracted because that peace treaty will be broke. It will be dissolved in the middle of it. It will be a seven-year peace treaty three and a half years into that peace treaty, it won't, it will be broken. And the Antichrist will expose himself. 
and then people will enter into great tribulation. That's why you and I have got to be alert. We must be consistent. Because once that peace treaty is signed, I'm telling you, you don't have to be concerned about anything else but your preparation for going home. Hello? That's why God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge in Hosea 4.6. That means you and I must maintain revelation all the time. Why? Because the word says that when there's revelation, the restraints stay. Amen? The restraints of what? The restraints of the flesh. So that you and I are not misled, distracted. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. You know, the word says that there'll be peace, peace, and sudden destruction. Because even in the first three and a half years of tribulation, there'll be a false peace. There will be a peace. There'll be a unity. There'll be prosperity. But people will get caught up in it. There'll still be wars and stuff going on. But people will be caught up. Only those that will know, only the watchers, those that are watching and hearing and praying will get understanding. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brother, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against the wiles or the trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, and where? Heavenly places. What does this mean? There are principalities, there are rulers of darkness, Amen? These are principalities and rulers of the darkness that are influencing hosts, with spiritual hosts influencing mankind, influencing every area. Principalities and rulers of darkness are powers of influence in spiritual hosts in the unseen realm. This is what he's explaining all the time. I'm going to say it again. There are principalities, which are fallen angels, there's rulers of darkness that are submissive to them. The demons, territorial spirits, strong, strong men, high-ranking demons, all kinds of influence. So there are principalities and rulers of darkness, our powers of influence in spiritual hosts in heavenly places known as the unseen realm that are constantly influencing me and you. We must be prepared and ready, dressed with the full armor of God, to resist, defend, attack, and drive out evil influence. Not only in this realm, but in the unseen realm. Amen? Amen. You know, remember, globalists are under the Antichrist agenda. Most of them don't even know. They think they're fighting for, one, for freedom. They don't even realize it. It's one world order is what they're fighting for. They believe that peace can be made in one world, that there'll be one world government, one world economy, and one world religion. That's what they're fighting for. That's why you see all these protesting going on. It's really got nothing to do with Christ. It's anti-Christ. Exodus 15. That's why we're building treasures in heaven. Amen? Amen. Too many people are trying to build treasures here. You're going to leave them. Can't take nothing with you. Exodus 15. But the Lord says he's going to bless us in both places, right? He's going to prosper us, even if he prospers us here. But it should be for the kingdom. Exodus 15 and verse 1. Is everybody there? Let's speak it, please. 
Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a what? A man of war. Yeah. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. He has chosen captives also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. The Lord is a man of war. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. <clears throat> In verse 13. Joshua 5 verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him, and he said to him, Are you for us, or are you our adversaries? So he said, No, but a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Who was this? Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's why he's called the Lord of hosts. He's the commander-in-chief of this army. And the commander of the Lord's army said to him, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Didn't the Lord do that to Moses too? Why? Because the world is cursed. He said, Take your shoes off. You're coming on holy ground now. Take what? In other words, he's saying, Get rid of all that. You're coming in my presence now. Remember, the Lord cursed the earth, didn't he? Cursed the ground, right? That's why it's corrupt. Is everybody okay? okay? Jesus is the commander of the army, is the Lord of hosts. <laughs> That's why creation is still corrupt. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. In Psalm 24. Psalm 24, let's speak this, starting at verse 1. There is going to be a clash of dimensional battles. That's what we call Armageddon. But there is a battle right now, big time. All those globalists that are under Satan's agenda are being exposed. Again, I don't know, a few weeks ago when the Lord shared about righteous reigning. Righteous is reigning right now. It may not seem it, but it's happening. Why? Because the body of Christ is now penetrating darkness. And it's exposing. It's kicking over the tables. It's preparing for the last harvest. We are preparing for the greatest harvest ever. In verse 1, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. I want you to understand, this is a, a requirement for rapture. Does everybody get it? He said, who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? Amen? Amen? And who can stand in his holy place? He who has a what? Pure heart and what? Clean hands. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him and who seek your face. So you must be a seeker. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up everlasting doors, 
and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts means the Lord of the army. He is the king of glory. 2 Kings 6. Second Kings chapter 6. Dimensional battles. Did you ever notice that when people get into arguments, one of the things they want to remind someone of what they've done? <laughs> Man, don't you remember when you did this? Well, you did this, and you did that. I mean, whose flesh is bigger, you know? It's a flesh fight. Not realizing the demons are there eating a full course meal. Yes, yes, <laughs> keep saying it. That's why the Lord says, forgive and move on. Learn from our mistakes. Preferably, you'll learn from somebody else's before you have to go through it. You know. Second Kings six verse eight. Is everybody there? Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, "My camp will be in such and such a place." And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us the, which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Because why? The Holy Spirit was revealing to them. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dathan. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great malt and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city and the horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, ma my master, what shall we do? And he said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, which was his servant, and he saw. And behold, a mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. And when the Syrians came down to him, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And the Lord struck them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. Now Elijah said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to the Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may eat. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But Elijah said, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more, into the land of Israel. So what did, they, what did they, he fed their enemies. He fed their enemies and said, get out of here, go back. They didn't come in that arena no more. Does everybody understand that? But the powerful thing about this is what the Lord showed him. See, Elisha knew. He knew that when he prayed, there was a host of army around him. Do you know that? 
Do you know that there's angels on your behalf? Did you know that you are, are, are granted, when you become a believer, you are granted a legion of angels, legion of angels. That means there's a minimum of 2,000 angels working on your, one be, on your behalf. And one angel can kill, kill 185,000 people. So what the heck are we worried about? Sheesh kebab. So we see that he showed him the unseen realm of the army working on our behalf when we what? When we pray and when we sing. Amen? Yeah. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, starting at verse 1, and let's speak it, please. I will bless the Lord at when? When I feel like it? When I don't feel like it? <laughs> At all times. Why? Because if you bless the Lord at all times, what are you going to maintain? His presence. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me out of, delivered me out of all my fears. But he started off about what? Praise continually on his mouth. No grumbling, no complaining, complete trust. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. I looked to him and were what? Radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Now are you ready? And the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who, who fear him or reverently honor him and respect him and delivers them. Does everybody see that? It is important. So this angel of the Lord of hosts that is around me and you can kill 185,000 people. But these are, he hangs around those who fear God, not around those who don't fear God. Ephesians 2. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by his plan or by grace you've been saved. And raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, you are in heavenly places. You may look, you may look around the room and say, man, but you're here. No, but you are seated in Christ. This is the dimension. See, not only is there a three-dimensional battle, but there's, we are multi-dimensional ourselves. But people don't understand it. Because in the spirit realm, there is no distance or time. We are already there. So everybody get this. Grab hold of this. I want you to see yourself seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's why you're blessed with every spiritual blessing. Amen? We have no excuse for failure. None. It's just the influence that causes a person to make choices that open doors of demonic activity and bring discouragement. But God doesn't look at you the way you look at you. He looks at you different as a warrior, seated with him, blessed with everything, armed and dangerous, and, and a storehouse of everything that you need, far above all you could ever ask or think he's trying to release to me and you. But as soon as you turn your heart away, things stop. Everything stops. It takes one phrase to stop everything. As soon as that heart becomes hardened or rebellious, everything stops. And God waits for us to turn. 
so he can be, continue to restore. Is everybody okay? Yes. Praise God. The prince of power of error is working in the people to rebel against God's will. Those born again awaken out of death and deception into the reality of this dimensional war and battles should seek to expand the kingdom of truth and establish his government on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we pray. We intercede. We fight. And overthrow Satan's global agenda and deceptions of the world order. This was prepared while we lived in darkness. God had me and you hidden in darkness. He's been waiting for you. He tried to pull us out a couple times, but we rejected. No, no, no. Then he placed people around us to pray for us. So we didn't die and go to hell. Amen. And we finally hit enough reality walls. We said, okay. And he said, Poof. pulled us right out. Amen. <laughs> so he prepared all of this and hid me and you in darkness till now. And so now that we've been taken out of darkness and we are the light carriers of Christ Jesus, we need to walk in this eternal calling has everybody got this we need to walk in this eternal calling god is using all the things of the world for you and i to penetrate so we can get he uses stuff so we can get to places but eventually when we get into those places he wants himself to be expressed amen first peter 2 In verse 1, remember the enemy loves to cause distractions. That's his job. Let's speak it. Therefore, laying aside all what? Malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. Everyone say grow. Thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also are living stones, are being built up a what? Spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. These spiritual sacrifices is praise and worship and decreeing the word. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a cornerstone, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes or follows Jesus will by no means be what? Put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become a chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. A rock of what? Offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word because they're not living out of the word. They're living out of emotion to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Again, the enemy causes distractions and promotion <laughs> or defense of self. What's he trying to do? He's trying to disrupt the true dimensional battle to free ourselves and free others and to keep the spirit of unity. In the area where people are immature, they don't get a chance to grow. Like I shared, when the heart turns, it stops them from growing. It stops them. It puts them in a state of stillness. And you know what? Water stays still for a while. It gets nasty. Nasty. Yeah. So the enemy wants to distract us from the true dimensional battle. Not only free us, but to free others and keep the spirit of unity. So it's important because when you see instability and inconsistency of individuals, 
It's because they're living out of the soul. They're allowing the emotional arena to constantly distract them. They're not living out of truth or out of the word. And it's important that we begin to understand that because we want to live out of the word of God. What does it do again? It slows the growth of an individual and sometimes stops it completely. That's where many individuals go back. They're looking for fulfillment and they look it in all the things of the world. God wants us to see what he sees and see what we are as he sees us in that golden armor of soldiers. Amen? Acts 17. Oh, hallelujah. Acts 17. Verse 22. Dimensional wars, dimensional battles. Is everybody there? Verse 22, let's speak it. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. <laughs> One other thing, let me tell you about religion. Religious. What happens is the enemy sucks people into self-righteous and religiousness. In this arena, because of the self-righteousness, is actually religion. Amen? And, and they replace the divine nature with self-righteousness. And they lose the promises of God because they're still trying to fill their own promises. Let's go on. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor does he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men and to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we what? We live and move and have our being. As also some of your poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to what? Repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this all by raising him from the dead. Wow. Again, people fall into the arena of religion. They exchange the divine nature for gold and silver and, and possessions and things to that degree. Uh, money, that's where the word tells us in the latter days that there'll be a love of self and love of money. This is idolatry. And they call it the will of God. And it's not God's will. Look, at God wants to bless our socks off. Amen? Amen? But too many people are working for money instead of having money work for them. We labor on to the Lord. And when the Lord blesses us, that money works for us. When that money is in your hand, it should be working for you. You should not be working for it. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I want to go to Revelation 12 for a second. I want to show you the clash of this dimensional battle that's coming. Revelation 12 and verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, Satan the powers of darkness will be forced into this realm. 
They'll be driven into this realm. They will become seen. He will persecute the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now, in this arena, first of all, the dragon is associated with Satan. I want you to also know that uh, the UN backs up Satan. This is also associated. The United Nations will also be associated with Satan's kingdom. He will be associated with the dragon. And that's where it's at right now. This is a twofold because, remember, there's two realms. Amen? So now as he says, he said that he will persecute the woman who gave birth to the male child. Well, we know that it's not Mary. Amen? Because she ain't here. She's home in heaven. So it means Israel. Amen? And the body of Christ. Watch. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for time, times, and half time. That's three and a half years. From the presence of the serpent. Now I want to explain this. The two eagle, the two wings of an eagle is United States and Moses and Elijah. Remember, there's a physical and there's a spiritual. The logo of the United States is the eagle with two wings, doesn't it? Why? It's saying that the United States is going to help Israel. That's why God put Trump in office. Does everybody get this? Do you know that we're getting ready to move our embassy right into Jerusalem? In fact, we don't even need to build a new building. They already have a building there. They just need to put the label on it. U.S. Embassy. Okay. So the woman, all right, is Israel in the body of Christ. Does everybody get it? The, the word says that uh, in, in Thessalonians that, remember when Moses and Elijah showed up? When Jesus was transfigured? Amen? Amen. And that's that transfiguration that's going to happen with me and you. These are the two witnesses that will come. So when we see what's going to happen, remember the two witnesses are going to be shot and killed and they're going to rise up. When they rise up and go, so do you and I. Because the two witnesses will come before the 144,000 witnesses. Is everybody okay? Okay. So these two witnesses that are going to come will be Moses and Elijah. Now, I don't think they're going to be dressed like Moses and Elijah. I don't know, you know. But they will be coming. In fact, they will come when the seven-year treaty is signed. Ooh, because they're going to be here telling, they'll be in Jerusalem. There'll be two prophets that show up in Israel and they'll be proclaiming because they're trying to awaken the people in Israel and prepare them for what's getting ready to come before the rapture. And then when those two are killed and they will be laid out three and a half days, then they'll be raised because they'll be represented because it'll be in mid-tribulation. It'll be three and a half years. Then the enemy will expose himself, proclaim himself as God. He'll break covenant of the seven-year treaty. And you and I are supposed to take off, God willing. Is everybody okay? Yes. All right, so we see two events that are happening. Israel will be helped by United States, amen? And the body of Christ will be removed. <laughs> Praise God. Verse 15. And the serpent, um, oh man. Yeah, let's go back to 14. Oh, no, 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now, this is Israel. Somebody got it. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. In other words, there's going to be a tremendous earthquake that's going to assist Israel also. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went and made war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God. Now, the commandments of God are associated with the Jews and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are people that are going to become believers. <laughs> Amen? Amen? When we leave. Has everybody got it? Because remember, the rapture is actually the final sign to all mankind that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Many people will get saved, or many believers that were not walking right with God will come to awakening and go, oh my God, I wasn't right. And they'll have to go through tribulation. Is everybody okay? Do you get this? So I want you to know that this seven-year treaty is around the corner. God willing. Romans 2. Some people are like, man, I'm not ready to go home yet. I haven't gotten my new house or new car. <laughs> I haven't started that big family I always wanted. You won't care when you get home. That'll be the least of your thoughts. <laughs> oh, glory. At least you don't have to worry about your bills anymore. <laughs> Now listen, when the seven-year treaty comes, I'm telling you, don't stop paying your bills. Because <laughs> you'll, you'll end up your last three and a half years in jail. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That'd be a bummer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 1, is everybody there? Let's speak it. Therefore, you are inexcusable, inexcus man, whoever you are, who judge for whenever you judge... Another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? That's religious garbage. That's how religious spirit works in people. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? Repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient or endurance continue in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self seeking and do not obey the truth but obey on righteousness indignation and wrath tribulation anguish and every soul of man who does evil of greek of jew first and also of greek but glory honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the jew first and also to the greek for there is no partiality with god philippians 3 Hallelujah. You know, sometimes it's hard for our peanut brain to get the reality that we are this close. We are literally this close. Philippians 3.13, please. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend it. But one thing I do is what? Forgetting those things that are which are behind that other dimensional past and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if and anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. What's he talking about? Cutting loose the past in preparation to fulfill your eternal call. And I want to close at 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 2. Let's speak it. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus. And his divine power is giving to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly and great precious promises. That's living from the future. If you're grabbing hold of his promises, you're living from the future into the present. You're decreeing these things. 
calling those things that are not as though they are, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For these things are yours and abound. You will be, if they're yours and you do this, you will never be what? Barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so for an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Powerful. Dimensional battles. Battle through. Get ready. Get prepared. Things are about to happen. Amen? Amen. That's why the word says be ready in season and out. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. I ask that you protect the word that's been parted in us and bring it to remembrance, protecting it by the blood of Christ, preparing our heart for communion in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say amen.